Good evening. It's great to see you from up here. I want to begin by uh, first giving my sincere thanks to my dear friends, Jeff Salzman, Terry Patton, Diane Hamilton, David Riordan, and of course, Ken Wilbur and many of the other people who've brought us together at this fabulous conference in this beautiful space. This is really the first time I've been um, asked to give a TED-style talk, and it, uh, it really caused me to have to sort of think about what the essence of my message is. Since my latest book came out in September, I've been traveling around, giving talks, but usually there's a, an abundant amount of time to sort of ramble on and let the thing unfold under its own course. But this TED-style talk is good because it makes you boil down the essence of your message. So over the last few days, as I've been thinking about the essence of my message, it's really about the, that evolution is the movement of spirit in the world. And when spirit moves, it makes things better. This is the, the real of thesis, that evolution is a spiritual process of the gradual perfection of the universe through intrinsic value, through the bringing in of the beautiful, the true, and the good, through a continuous uh, a sequence of improvement. And these intrinsic values, the beautiful, the true, and the good, they, they aren't just there. It's not just the myth of the given situation. These values require our recognition to be brought into being, right? We have to realize these values to bring them into the universe. However, we're not just makers of the beautiful, the true, and the good. We're also finders of these values. And there is a dynamic kind of ontological quality of the universe. And as our consciousness evolves, we can come to see this quality with new depth and clarity. It's as if these, these intrinsic forms of value are really the comprehensible elements of divinity that we can use for our own spiritual growth and for giving our gift to the world. One of my favorite quotes is from the American sage, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote that every natural fact is a symbol of some higher spiritual fact. And if we think about it, evolution is the biggest natural fact we can possibly see or know. Evolution isn't just something that's happening in the universe. It's really more accurate to say that the universe is evolution happening. This 13 billion year trajectory of unfolding through matter, life, and now consciousness and culture, it really is a symbol, indeed a, a, a manifestation of a spiritual teaching, a profound and sacred spiritual teaching. So tonight I want to leave you with three ideas that are uh, arising from the spiritual message of evolution. The first idea is that we are agents of evolution, that the creator of the universe has shared her prerogatives with us, and so that we get to participate in the grand adventure of bringing the infinite into the finite. The second point is that as we come to understand the role of the intrinsic values of the beautiful, the true, and the good, when we see how central these are to the evolutionary process, that indeed evolution is about the bringing of intrinsic value, the bringing of the presence of the infinite, which we see refracted into the forms of the beautiful, the true, and the good. Um, when we come to understand that more fully and work with it, get, become skillful with this sort of understanding of the spiritual message of evolution, it really makes a big difference in our own personal spiritual development and the effectiveness of the work that we're doing in the world. And then the third, the third idea, the third point I want to make is that a deeper understanding of evolution can lead directly to a more evolved world. That this, this unlocking of, of really the, the essence of the evolutionary process can really allow, give us the power to build a higher form of civilization. It's really, um, uh, it's an exciting time to be alive with all this sort of new truth entering the universe, especially the truth that we, we get to see so to my first point, we are agents of evolution. The prominent biologist Terence Deacon is famous for the quote, that to be human is to know what it feels like to be evolution happening. And this is a, a sort of an insight into the fact that, that our, our moral and aesthetic ambitions, our, our innate curiosity, 
our sense of duty to live up to our potential and do the right thing, this is in a way the experience of the forces that have been driving and drawing evolution for the last 13 billion years. And one of the ways we can come to understand how we are, in a sense, evolution is concentrating its, its purposes and its methods within us, is to see that we literally embody all of evolution, both physically and psychologically, within us. We're microcosms of the entire process. And uh, as, we, as we come to see this, as we come to see how we are, you know, in a sense, these agents of evolution, um, one of the ways that this is proved is how we carry the origin in us. The origin is ever present. So for example, we can see how every level of emergence from the Big Bang all the way through matter, life, and mind, in a sense, is contained within us. We contain the hydrogen debris of the Big Bang in our water molecules. We contain the periodic table of elements in our bones. And our bodies, in a sense, are using every evolutionary emergence, every innovation, every form of success within the biosphere that has led to the relative transcendence of the biosphere itself. And in the same way that all the levels of emergence are here with us now, in, our, in ourselves, physically, we can also see something very similar in the evolutionary impulse within us that we can feel is, is also a kind of a embodiment of all the levels of emergence. We share with our animal cousins the, 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 the evolutionary impulse, the urge to survive and reproduce. Right? We feel that when we feel fear, when we feel hunger, when we feel sexual desire. These are the, are the evolutionary impulses that drive the evolution of life. Right? Natural selection would be impossible if there wasn't intentionality within life. And this same intentionality, this same evolutionary impulse, we can feel a continuum as it moves into the realm of consciousness and culture. Right? This, is, this is a new domain of evolution, but the evolutionary impulse continues in this sequence of emergence. In the domain of consciousness and culture, evolution occurs when people try to improve their conditions. And for the last 40,000 years, humans have been working to improve their conditions. But the, the opportunities to make things better are, in a sense, defined by the, re, the, the, the values of the worldview that you're using to make meaning. In other words, each worldview is like an octave of beauty, truth, and goodness. You know, sort of defines what's valuable and, and constrains what you can do to make things better. But not only have humans been trying to improve their conditions, They've also, they've improved their conditions most dramatically when they've improved their definition of improvement itself. When they, a new worldview emerges with a new octave of values that defines beauty, truth, and goodness in a more inclusive and, and deeper, broader way. Like with the emergence of modernism, it, it defined the opportunities for improvement by opening up new ideals of morality which led to democracy and, and a deeper understanding of truth which led to science. So we can begin to see how the evolutionary impulse itself evolves. That, 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 that every new worldview, every new set of values, every new octave of beauty, truth, and goodness is an extension of the evolutionary impulse itself. And we really have the opportunity, as those who are, who are living here on the horizon of history, seeing the evolutionary worldview sort of in its infancy, see, be, being aware of integral right at the very beginning, we have the opportunity to extend the evolutionary impulse and act as agents of evolution um, in, in a really unique and, uh, and powerful way. And when we come to understand the evolutionary impulse from this perspective, we can see how it's not just arising within us. It's not just a, uh, a drive, but we're also being pulled. That human needs can never be satisfied because as soon as we satisfy one set of needs, we awaken to a, a new set of problems and a new set of potential improvements. So we can begin to sense how, in a sense, the beautiful, the true, and the good are not only arising within us, but they're, they're, they have a kind of gravity that we're being drawn by. Like the, the, the intrinsic quality is like a, a great attractor of evolution that's pulling it forward. And this, this value gravity, in a sense, is another example of Emerson's insight that every natural fact uh, is a symbol of a larger spiritual fact. Which brings me to my second point about the central significance of the beautiful, the true, and the good in the evolutionary process. One of the founders 
of uh, integral philosophy, one of its great founding geniuses was Alfred North Whitehead. And Whitehead actually defined evolution as an increase in the ability to experience what is intrinsically valuable. This is worth repeating. According to Whitehead, evolution itself is an increase in our ability to recognize value. And I think this insight of Whitehead really gets to the heart of what evolution is, and that is the gradual perfecting of the finite universe uh, through the evolution of consciousness, through the following of the evolutionary impulse and the pull of value gravity. You know, Whitehead also said that beauty is the final contentment of the eros of the universe. And he really was, you know, on to this values role within evolution overall. So when I talk about intrinsic value, like Whitehead, I like to use the rubric of the beautiful, the true, and the good, as you uh, probably noticed. But this is sort of a, a, a these, these, these in, most intrinsic values that have been recognized since antiquity are, are a good rubric for talking about value because it, it, it shows how it's a system. It shows how it's diversified. You know, just like three primary colors can be combined and contrasted to produce our entire visual field, we can see how the primary values of beauty, truth, and goodness, in a sense, represent the spectrum of dynamic quality. So what are these values? What is beauty, truth, and goodness? My conviction is that it's actually the presence of the infinite. You know, that the non-dual absolute, the ultimate unity, in a sense, when when we make, when, as our consciousness evolves, and we're able to see the value of the universe with new depth and clarity, it's as if the, the, the ultimate form of unity refracts into the colors of the beautiful, the true, and the good. Like um, Ramana Maharshi taught, the infinite doesn't enter the phenomenal realm. Rather, the, the phenomenal realm becomes transparent to the infinite that's lying underneath. Just like if you're watching a movie and the movie, screen, the movie would, would end and you'd see the screen that was underneath, this is, a, this is a way to understand the role of value. It's like, we're, we're, as, as Gebser said, we're, as we evolve our consciousness, the finite phenomenal realm becomes diaphanous, and spirit begins to shine through. We can see it with greater depth and clarity. And one of the markers that the beautiful, the true, and the good are elements of the infinite, are sort of markers of the presence of the infinite, is that these are each forms of unity themselves. Like beauty has been described as the unification of contrasts. And truth is really the unification of our mind, the unification of our thinking with what's real, with reality. Even goodness is a form of unity, you know, kind of right relation between self and other. You know, this sort of goodness is, is really based in love and it's its ultimate kind of form of unity. So this understanding of the beautiful, the true, and the good as the presence of the infinite drawing evolution forward, attracting consciousness is a great attractor, it helps us appreciate our role in the universe. In other words, I don't think our role is just to simply eliminate the finite and go back to the, to the beginning, to go back to the source. I think that we have, we have purposes and we have a purpose. We have reasons and we have a reason. And our reason for being in the universe as agents of evolution is to participate in this grand adventure of, of perfecting the finite universe gradually through the evolution of our consciousness and the giving of our gift of service uh, to make the world a better place and to make, indeed, the universe a better place. And this understanding of the relationship between the finite and the infinite in evolution not only tells us about evolution's purpose and evolution's process, it also gives us a hint about the evolutionary structure of the whole. In other words, one of the leap motifs of evolution, one of the patterns that we see in just about every uh, um, domain and every, every form is this ubiquitous process known as the dialectic, right? Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is one of the ways that it's been simplified. And this dialectic is like fractally, dist fractally distributed throughout the entire uh, evolutionary process. And this gives us a clue that maybe the dialectical parts are pointing to the dialectical whole that the structure of evolution overall can be conceived as the infinite, non-dual, perfect source as like the thesis, and then the antithesis being the finite universe. You know, it's partial, it's not being, it's becoming. And out of the, the thesis and the antithesis of the infinite and the finite, a synthesis is arising, which we call evolution. 
And this synthesis is you know, a way of sort of reuniting uh, the polarity of the infinite and the finite, you know, the, the, the being and the becoming at a higher level of expression. This is a process that White had referred to as gentle persuasion through love. Which brings me to my third and final point, which is that a deeper understanding of evolution can lead directly to a more evolved world. We know from integral philosophy that the evolution of consciousness and culture is real evolution. Although it can't be conflated with biological evolution, it's nonetheless sort of the latest phase of the universe's process, 13 billion year process of becoming. And when we know that it's real evolution, we can see evolutionary patterns, we can see that within the evolution of consciousness and culture, there's an internal cultural ecosystem. And when we add to this the insight that intrinsic value, that beauty, truth, and goodness actually draws consciousness forward, that it causes evolution. We can see that if, like for, if it was a physical, biological ecosystem, we could nourish it by adding water or by adding energy. And we could begin to understand how we can nourish, nourish the, this internal cultural ecosystem through skillful applications of value tailored to the level of the people who we're trying to serve. It's like the promise of this new understanding of the spiritual nature of evolution can provide a kind of social medicine by which we can raise consciousness and heal, heal the wounds of the world like never before. You know, from an integral perspective, every, just about every problem in the world can be understood, at least partially, as a problem of consciousness. So if we could figure out a way to really raise consciousness more effectively, we could solve so many of the world's problems more effectively than ever before. Just like during the, uh, the Enlightenment, Right? The, the rise of modernist consciousness has allowed us to see the external world and grab hold of it and manipulate it with new powers and new clarity. And that led to scientific medicine, which uh, improved the human condition tremendously. And now, with the rise of the evolutionary worldview, we can begin to see the internal universe with the same kind of new power and new clarity. And, and this is giving us the ability to apply value and, and use it as a, as a way to heal the wounds of the world uh, that could achieve, as Jeff said, spectacularly tangible results. You know, and as Gail said, our, our role here as agents of evolution is not only to, to feed and clothe the world, you know, with the material that we need, but we also we need to nourish the world with the value that they need. You know, it's teachings of truth, expressions of beauty, and uh, services of goodness that really raise consciousness and make the world a better place. And so each of us, I think, who can see it here in the beginning. I think we're all called to be part. It's, it's as if by helping to actualize this evolutionary worldview through all the work that we're doing, we actualize ourselves. We get to participate in a once in a millennium opportunity of fantastic emergence in this realm of consciousness and culture. And as we use value, it uses us. You know, that we, we find that the gifts that we give to others provide the rungs of the ladder of our own ascent. You know, we become more evolved and the world becomes more evolved as we experience and create the intrinsic values of the beautiful, the true, and the good. I think it's literally true. We are agents of evolution. Our purposes are its purposes. Thanks.